Bereshit Bara Elohim Et HaShemayim Ve'et Ha'are In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. From the San Diego, California headquarters of the Institute for Creation Research, here are ICR scientists and Back to Genesis lecturers, Dr. John D. Morris and Ken Ham. One of the clearest teachings in all of scripture is that of a worldwide flood which destroyed the earth in the days of Noah. If there was such a flood, you would expect to find evidence of it. Do we find such evidence? Can we prove Noah's flood was a real historic event? Ken, in reality, we cannot prove anything in the unobserved past. What we can do as scientists is to go back to Genesis and get our framework straight, our basic facts straight there, and then make what we call predictions. If the Genesis account is right, then we would predict that certain things would exist in geology, but if evolution is right, then other predictions follow. And then we can compare the accuracy of these predictions against the real geologic data to see which one is more likely correct. But we can't, in reality, prove either one. In this program, Dr. Morris demonstrates that creationist predictions about the flood are overwhelmingly supported by the scientific data. Let's watch. Our lecture for this afternoon is on the subject of Noah's Flood. Noah's Flood obviously was a world restructuring event that happened uh, fairly soon after creation. And if that flood happened, we would expect to find the results of that in the world that we study today. I am convinced that the flood of Noah is really a bottom line issue in understanding this, this creation evolution controversy. Because if Noah's Flood really did happen, I mean, if it really did happen, I mean, if it really did happen, the thing that it would have done best, the thing that you would expect it to do and the thing that you couldn't keep it from doing is to lay down all the rocks and fossil record that we see on the Earth's crust. I'm convinced that that flood totally restructured the surface of the globe. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Those are like military terms. The, the world was over, overwhelmed. It was just conquered and it perished due to the flood. What we see in the world today is the results of Noah's flood. We see, we, we see the results, of course, of creation, but we don't see creation. In, very, in, the, in the exact same way, we see the results of Noah's flood, but we don't see Noah's flood. As we look at these rocks and the fossils, keep in mind that rocks and fossils don't come with labels on them. Rocks and fossils must be interpreted within light of uh, the assumption set that you have before you, study the, before you study those rocks and fossils. And I'm convinced that as we study them through a biblical mindset, that our interpretation will always be a working solution that will be better than any other interpretation that's possible. But it's those rocks and the fossils which are thought to be the proof of evolution, are they not? If you ask an evolutionist, where's the evidence for evolution? Where's the evidence that the earth is billions of years old? The answer will always be in the rocks and fossils. But it's a misinterpretation of those rocks and fossils that would lead them to use those in support of evolution or an old earth. But I'm convinced that if the flood really happened the way the Bible says it happened, then it laid down those rocks and fossils and there is no evidence for evolution or an old earth. One's assumptions that he holds before he looks at the rocks and fossils is easily the most important part of that whole interpretation process. I'm convinced that, that the assumptions, the, the glasses that you have on before you look at the evidence, well, it not only colors the experiments that you run, colors the, the data that you think are important, but it, to a great degree, dictates your interpretation and your conclusions. Let me illustrate how this works from a, an evolutionary mindset. There was a naturalist a few years ago down in Argentina who was studying the Santa Cruz River Valley in southern Argentina. This naturalist had with him a copy of the book Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell, the book that promoted the concept of uniformity in, in Earth history. The idea is that the present is the key to the past. What we see going on in the present is what's always gone on, and so geologists that hold that particular perspective interpret the past in light of what is going on in the present. Well, this naturalist saw the river 
flowing through a huge canyon, not as big as a Grand Canyon, but a very large canyon, and he interpreted it, as you see, as having been formed by that river, flowing back and forth, migrating back and forth through this river valley, carving out this whole big canyon. He says it, 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 uh, the river today does very little geologic work, just small, inconsiderable fragments are carried on by this river, but he said, yet in the lapse of the ages, it might accomplish this whole erosive event by these slow and gradual processes. The present is the key to the past. Did he see that canyon formed? Was he there when it was formed? No, he sees the modern river, and he sees that's not doing much geologic work, but give it enough time and it'll carve out this whole canyon. Well, we now know that he was wrong. That canyon was not carved by that river. It was carved evidently during the Ice Age when a, a glacier came through here and, and scooped out this, this large canyon. Nobody would disagree with that nowadays. But this naturalist went from here thinking in this mindset that the present is the key to the past. Thinking that way in geology, he went from here over to the Galapagos Islands where he began to see finches and other uh, biologic activity and, and imposing slow and gradual processes on on what he sees today, assuming that those processes operated through the past, he came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. The naturalist's name was Charles Darwin, and I'm convinced he was just as wrong at the Galapagos Islands as he was in southern Argentina. The present is not the key to the past. The present is what's going on in the present. But uh, the past, we need something else as the key to interpreting that. 30 or so years ago, the very famous book, The Genesis Flood, was published, published, uh, authored by two, uh, two individuals, one a theologian, one a scientist, and they produced for the very first time a systematic, including scientific defense of, of Scripture. This book, I'm convinced, started the whole biblical inerrancy movement. It certainly started the creation movement. For the very first time, Christians became made aware that you can defend Scripture. It, it works. It makes sense. It's defensible. This book, The Genesis Flood, uh, is to the Christian what Charles Darwin's book, Origin of Species, is to the humanist. This book gives the biblical worldview scientific credibility. This book belongs on every Christian's shelf, I'm convinced. It's had over 100,000 copies of it out now, and we still get letters there at ICR on a weekly basis, I, I suspect, of folks that have picked up this book on, on, a, on, on geology and come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. This is, this is just a, a Lord-anointed book, I'm convinced. As we try to put on the biblical pair of glasses and to look and see what it all the, um, the Bible has to say about the flood, let's go back into Scripture and, and go back to Genesis, as it were, and, and set up a, a brief history of that, of that flood. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, that God used several mechanisms to bring about the flood. Now, the flood, of course, was a, was a supernatural judgment on a very sinful world at the time of Noah. But while God was accomplishing his, his supernatural judgment, he was using physical processes. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, he tells us what those processes were. You remember that verse, perhaps, it was on a particular day, the 600th year of Noah's life. He says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken open, and the windows of heaven were open, and, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a geologically loaded couple of verses there. When it says the windows of heaven were opened, the word windows is not like windows in a building. The windows, is, it has more to do with, with sluice gates on a dam, something like that. You see, that's what the Bible says. That doesn't tell us all about the Grand Canyon, but there are geological inferences we can draw from that, from that reference. If indeed the, the sluice gates of heaven were opened and vast amounts of water poured down on the earth, well, think what sort of erosion that would, re, that would result in. Think what sort of redeposition of eroded material would, would occur. You see, we can, we can get what Scripture has to say and say, if this is true, we ought to be able to see the results of that sort of thing in the real world. And that's what I think we see when we look at geology. The windows of heaven, incredible amounts of rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the windows stayed open for 150 days. The Bible also talks about all the fountains of the great deep being broken open. The deep in Scripture is the ocean. The great deep is evidently down in there, maybe down 